I want to thank you for joining my presentation, Preventing Cross-Infection in the Pulmonary Function Lab. My name is Terrence Shenfield, and I am the co-owner of a and Respiratory Lectures. So why should we be concerned about infection control practices in the PFT lab? First of all, the Pulmonary Function Lab plays a crucial role in the diagnostic evaluation of patients with lung disease. So if you got patients who have lung disease, the likelihood of them transmitting this disease to another patient is a real concern. Cross infection acquired in the pulmonary function lab is typically rare, but it does occur. Think about just the COVID pandemic that just passed. I remember at our hospital, we actually closed the pulmonary function lab because we were concerned about cross infection with going on. So a lot of times uh, due to the patient daily flow, uh, you really need to have some kind of proper disinfection techniques set up for the lab. You need to have a way of monitoring the patients that come in and come out. You have to also consider the staff members. So this presentation is going to go over a few different recommendations and different strategies that you could use. And it's also going to speak to some of the most cross infections that do occur in this area. Today's objectives, we're going to be talking about the risk and potential organisms implicated in cross infection in the pulmonary function lab. Uh, we're going to talk about the sources of these organisms. Where do they come from? We're going to be talking about methods of contamination. We're going to be talking about sterilization and disinfection techniques. Uh, we're going to also be talking about preventative measures to prevent the cross infections. And we'll also be talking about newer methods in the future of infection control practices in a PFT lab. So by the end of this presentation, you're going to have a good handle on how to manage your lab. There are many sources of contamination in the pulmonary function lab. You do spirometry testing, you do body plasmography, you do diffusing lung capacities, you do bronchial challenges, you do sputum induction. Some laboratories do cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So many different things going on. With all these different tests, patients are required to take some deep breaths. They have to do tidal breathing. They have to do forced expiratory maneuvers. They have to do deep inspiratory and expiratory maneuvers all resulting in uh, the possibility of spreading infection. For example, when someone um, coughs and they cough during a pulmonary function test, the likelihood of droplet uh, contamination is really real. The American Thoracic Society has recommended cleaning guidelines also developed by the National Committee of Clinical Laboratory Standards, commonly known as NACLs, and the Center of Disease Control. So all of them talk about um, recommendations for maintaining hygiene in a pulmonary function lab. We're going to get into a lot more detail about these tests and the likelihood of infections. And I'm also going to be talking about some of the infections that can occur as, a, as an impact of cross-contamination. There are many guidelines set in place by the Center of Disease Control and uh, the American Thoracic Society has offered some recommendations. But most of the patients who come into the pulmonary function lab have some form of underlying uh, respiratory problem. They can have a pneumonia, they can have asthma, they can have COPD, they can have a whole host of um, conditions that require the patients to do pulmonary function tests. A lot of these patients are required to do breathing maneuvers such as tidal breathing, forced expiratory maneuvers, as well as deep inspiratory and expiratory maneuvers. Sometimes these patients cough into the device during this because they have bronchospasm. And if they have an underlying infection, they're gonna cough directly right into uh, the pulmonary function device. Um, so you really, you need to have some kind of um, guidelines on what you're going to do on a pulmonary function. You need to have protect the staff members, you know, from any kind of cross infection, as well as other patients who come into the laboratory. 
So, you know, these are some of the things you need to be concerned about in the PFT lab. When working in the pulmonary function lab, the likelihood of getting a cross infection is a very real thing. You could come in contact with the patient through direct contact. You could also be subjected to aerosolized particles. You could also have um, contaminated saliva and other body fluids. Um, the organism that you come in contact, its virulence has a number of different factors going along with it. Number one, what is the pathogen? What is the strain of the pathogen? The inoculation rate, the viability of the pathogen on exposed room temperature. Um, also, you know, the roots of inactivity, the particle size, so many different factors go in to how the organism can be transported Form to one patient to another or from one patient to another healthcare worker. So you have your contact precautions, which can be spread directly or indirectly. You have droplet precautions, which are basically are large particles in the air. Some of the concerns with droplet particles are, for example, um, viral infections, influenza. We have measles, you have chicken pox, pneumonia, tuberculosis. All of these uh, can be uh, trans, uh, trans um, they can be transferred to the uh, around the area by droplet precaution. Then you have airborne precautions, and you know these are a whole host of other organisms that can impact you. So you know you got to be really careful in the lab. You got to be prepared. You got to be uh, diligent. You got to do a few of the recommendations that I'm going to be speaking about a little bit later. Let's talk about skin contact. You know, skin contact can be quite innocent. Someone can walk in the lab and greet you and say, how are you, shake your hand. Uh, that's a source of a transmission of infection. A lot of direct skin contact is a source of rhinoviruses and pseudomonas. Repetitive lung function tests are extremely prone to cross infection uh, due to contact. So in other words, some people have uh, an infection and they come in for serial pulmonary function tests and the likelihood of them transferring the organism to you is pretty high. An example of this is cystic fibrosis patients. Cystic fibrosis patients um, are prone to skin contact um, infections and also the transmission of those infections to other parties. So these are some of the things you got to think about. In the pulmonary function lab, we have many different devices and consumables. For example, we have spirometers, we have consumables uh, such as mouthpieces and rebreathing valves, we have nebulizers, we have peak flow meters, and we also talk about the laboratory infrastructure. All of these are a source of infection uh, to spread to other patients. When you think about it, the disposable waste generated in the pulmonary function lab, such as mouthpieces, paper napkins, act as reservoirs for microorganism, increasing the risk of cross infection. Because we have so many uh, disposable consumables and we put them in garbage, that is a reservoir of infection. So I'm gonna go over each of these items in detail so you understand a little bit more about it. The spirometer is the most used instrument in the pulmonary function lab. Among the various components of the spirometer, the mouthpiece has the greatest risk of bacterial contamination in the rate of around 92%, followed by the proximal tubing, which is around 50%. No contamination has been so far been reported with samples taken within the equipment. So most of the problem occurs with the mouthpiece. Um, as this risk concurs, not only do patients also have a risk, but also healthcare workers with the use of contaminated equipment, especially reusable disposable mouthpieces. So when you really think about it, you absolutely need to have disposable mouthpieces. Water sealed spirometers, which are now rarely used in clinical practice, have been a common site of bacterial colonization in the past. Um, however, 
it's not been demonstrated that this increases the risk of transmission of respiratory infections from the machine to patients or healthcare workers. On the other hand, the risk of transmission of infection is minimal with an ultrasonic sensor-based spirometer. The mouthpiece, which is the only part of the spirometer that comes in contact with the patient, is replaced after every use. This reduces the risk of cross-infection to a minimum. There is no information available on the risk of bacterial contamination of flow sensor-based spirometers, such as the turbine-based spirometer and the unheated pneumotachograph. So these are some of the things you gotta be concerned about. There are many consumables found in the pulmonary function lab. With these, you have mouthpieces, you have rebreathing valves, you have tubings, and all of these are disposable. Mouthpieces are the most common cause of cross-infection of pulmonary function equipment. When these get contaminated with the patient's saliva, they actually can introduce pathogenic organisms into the patient. Some of the concerns we have, some kind of organisms, we have HIV, we have hepatitis V, uh, hepatitis B, we have hepatitis C, hepatitis D. Uh, they can all be transmitted via contaminated body fluids, but the likelihood of getting an HIV infection via saliva is really low. Nevertheless, um, hepatitis B infections have been shown to be in saliva, so you really got to be a little careful with that. Pseudomonas, uh, also Neisseria, are some of the organisms found in mouthpieces and which could cause great harm to the patient. Um, you also have fungi and yeast infections such as Aspergillus and Cryptococcus. They can be quite harmful to the patient. Inhalation of fungal spores can lead to fatal pulmonary infections as well as infections in the central nervous system. So really, consumables need to be um, either disposable or they have to be processed correctly, which I have some slides talking about that a little further on. Let's turn our attention to nebulizers and spaces. These devices are used quite often in the pulmonary function lab to do bronchial challenge testing, sputum induction, reversibility testing, and nebulizers and spaces can also contribute to the cross infection in the pulmonary function lab. It has been shown that when not properly maintained, they can be colonized with Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus infection, also different types of bacteria. So um, the concept that nebulizers have to be maintained properly in the diagnostic arena is imperative. You really need to take care of these because they're a great source of infection or cross infection with patients. A lot of times patients who use these devices at home, they don't maintain them very well, resulting in uh, infections from growth in them. So, uh, but it really doesn't happen too much in the pulmonary function lab in a hospital setting, but you still need to be diligent about the processing and care of them. So these peak flow meters that you see in the picture are great devices. They are great in an outpatient use and they are used on multiple patients. So there is growing concern amongst the healthcare professionals that the use of a single device on multiple patients can have some kind of cross-infection issue. There are concerns that sharing the same peak flow meter with, between patients is a health hazard. And even though you might use disposable mouthpieces, you still have a concern that is there a likelihood of a cross-infection with these devices. As of today, there's no published evidence showing that any kind of infection can be acquired by using these devices. But you gotta concern yourself that there's a lot of respiratory infections out there, such as, you know, uh, MRSA, you have also, you have fungal infections, and you really gotta be a little bit careful. Um, 
So it's crucial to use these devices in the outpatient setting as a diagnostic tool. It's really convenient. You might even use this in the pulmonary function lab. The likelihood of getting a transmission of a infection um, has not been too uh, published yet. There's not too much out there, but I just wanted to point it out that um, um, they are investigating the possibility of using these devices with cross infections in the lab. So when I'm talking about laboratory infrastructure, I'm talking about how is the laboratory situated? Where it is in the hospital? Is it a new lab? Is it an old lab? Does it have air conditioning? Does it have nice new furniture? Does it have carpeting? All of these things can impact the transmission of infections. For example, dusty work services can also harbor all kinds of pathogens and increase the risk of contamination. If you have a room that has high temperature and humidity, that provides a great environment for the growth of pathogens. Upholstery, like if you got like chairs that are thick in upholstery or carpeting or curtains, all of this can be fertile ground for infections, especially Mercer infections. Air conditioners in the lab need to be maintained regularly. You need to keep them clean. Legionella, a gram-negative bacteria, has been found widely in air conditioning, cooling towers, and water systems in hospitals. Hospital water supplies have also been contaminated with mycobacterium and pseudomonas. So really, your infrastructure in your hospital and how it's maintained is really important to the health of your healthcare workers, especially those who come in to get tested, such as your COPD patients and also the elderly patients and so also the cystic fibrosis patients. So you really need to maintain the infrastructure of your lab and maintain your air conditioning and maintain your humidity because all of these things have an impact on uh, the pathogenic uh, activity in the lab and also the transmission of these organisms. So I wanted to talk about some of the most common pathogens found in the pulmonary function lab. I have about three slides talking about different types of uh, organisms that are found to be pathogenic and are especially found to be in the pulmonary function lab. And we all know about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has been an aged old disease. Um, not too often do we see it in this country, but there are cases in different sections of this country where tuberculosis is uh, pretty, not common, but it's enough to be seen around. For example, I used to work in Newark, uh, New Jersey, and we used to have a lot of patients with TB and they actually had both TB and HIV. So really these patients sometimes are brought in for pulmonary function tests. And so you really need to sort of do your best to manage them. So for example, um, people who are diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis um, need to be uh, separated from other patients. They really have to be because it's, you know, potentially of them getting an airborne uh, infection is really real. Droplets become quite viable because, you know, patients cough, they sneeze, they talk, whatever they got to do, and it could, could be suspended in air. These rooms need to have negative pressure. So in these particular cases, when you're thinking about TB, really think about airborne precautions, think about negative pressure, things about thinking about things that could really help the laboratory. Another common um, organism found is called, it used to be Pseudomonas sapacea, now it's called Burkholderia sapacea. And basically that is an organism found quite common in cystic fibrosis patients. So cystic fibrosis patients, they come into the laboratory to get serial tests for pulmonary function. And this organism, which is typically resistant to antibiotics, needs to be watched. How, it's, how, how you can get it is person-to-person -person contact. Also, it could be on contaminated services and especially immunocompromised patients who are resistant to bacteria. So these are some of the concerns you have. 
sometimes you need to test them in a separate room and you have to use like contact precautions. So that's another group. And finally, the third group uh, called Bronhamiella. And basically these types of um, organism can be found in the pulmonary function lab. It leads to lower respiratory infections, especially impacts immunosuppressed patients. And again, this particular group are you got to concern yourself about droplet precautions. So these are three of the organisms that are found in the pulmonary function lab, and we have some more to follow up after this. Let's cover some other pathogens commonly found in the pulmonary function lab. As I was saying in the previous slide, we're going to go over the most common uh, bacteria found in, um, in the laboratory. We know the laboratory is full of respiratory viruses. You have Staphylococcus aureus, you have a Streptococcus pneumonia. These are common pathogens found in the lab. The people who have to be the most concerned with this are children and the elderly people, as well as immunocompromised. With these particular patients that come in, you really got to consider airborne precautions and also you have to consider contact precautions because this could be quite severe. Haemophilus influenza is another type of bacteria that is commonly found in the pulmonary function lab. It can lead to meningitis, it can lead to bloodstream infections, it can lead to a whole host of infections in the body. Especially for those who are immunosuppressed, it can really be bad. In this particular group, again, airborne precautions, skin precautions, uh, contact precautions. Also, you need to sort of um, wonder, wonder what's going on with these mechanisms to prevent infection and the spread of infections. Finally, we get Legionella. Legionella, um, they had a big outbreak back in Philadelphia, I believe in 1976. So many people got sick. Um, a lot of times it's, it, it likes moist environments. So uh, water systems, air conditioning systems have been um, found to be harvesting this bacteria. Um, so you really need to consider everyone in the room, anyone who's you know, this organism can impact everyone in the room. So really what you got to do is have regular cleaning of the cooling towers, air conditioning systems, and this has been shown to prevent the spread of this particular pathogen. To continue our list of pathogens, we're going to cover Neisseria, which are various species. Uh, we're going to be talking about HIV, and we're going to finally be talking about hepatitis B and C viruses. Regarding Neisseria, Neisseria is, uh, there's many different organisms that occur with this um, pathogen. The ones that uh, impact humans is meningitis and also gonorrhea. But I don't think you have to worry about gonorrhea in the pulmonary function lab, at least hope not. Uh, so in this particular group, uh, the, the group that you have to really watch are people who are immunocompromised, who come into the lab and, you know, you got a bunch of them. Um, you know, this can really cause some real problems for people. Uh, precautions you need to take are airborne precautions plus droplet precautions. These are, would prevent the spread of it. Regarding HIV, um, obviously HIV is uh, really impacting the immunocompromised group. Um, HIV can be spread by fluids, but not necessarily saliva. They've done some tests with that or handshakes or contact, but it can be, you know, it's a bloodborne pathogen and it can be spread by, you know, certain fluids in the body but saliva is not one of them. Again, you should take droplet precautions and contact precautions with these patients. Regarding hepatitis B and C, uh, the likelihood of getting uh, hepatitis B and C is really, uh, it's real. Um, hepatitis B um, can be, again, transmitted through fluids in the body, but uh, they have not found much with saliva. Um, even less risk with hepatitis C, there's not much going on with that. But, you know, really you should consider all patients in the room if you happen to have hepatitis B, which I consider a little bit more severe than hepatitis C, 
because it's much more contagious, hepatitis B, than C. Cap hepatitis C would be more or less bloodborne or it could be sexually transmitted sometimes. Um, how you control this, hepatitis B can be controlled by immunization. I'm sure all of us who worked in the healthcare system have been immunized for hepatitis B. Um, hepatitis C, there's no uh, vaccine at this point, but you should be looking at droplet precautions to prevent the spread of these infections. Our last slide talking about potential pathogens in the pulmonary function lab. We're going to be talking about varicella, measles, and aspergillus. So let's start off with varicella. Varicella, commonly known as chicken pox, is a highly infectious disease. Typically, children get chicken pox, and if you know they get better after a while, but if you get a reinfection as an adult, that causes shingles. So you really got to be careful with this. So everyone is at risk for this particular virus. Um, some of the precautions you have to take is airborne precautions and direct contact, especially some patients who might have skin lesions and other type of lesions on their skin. This can be a form of transmission for the virus. So this is something very seriously to think about, and it's called varicella zoster, commonly known as chicken pox. The second group of we're going to talk about is measles. You know, measles has been uh, resolved since 1963 with the widespread vaccination, but you know, it really, um, really caused some havoc back in its day. Um, a lot of people died from measles in 2018. You know, I've looked at some stats, and it was like 140,000 people have died from it. And so re measles is something that is highly contagious. Uh, it mostly lives in the throat and the mucous membranes of people. Uh, people who cough can or sneeze can actually spread measles. So it's basically you need to have airborne precautions plus contact precautions. And this applies to every individual who can be in contact with it. The final one is Aspergillus. Aspergillus is a type of fungus, and basically it's found both indoors and outdoors. So most people breathe in the fungal spores every day, but it really doesn't cause any kind of problem. But some people can get an infection from it, and basically it's transmitted through inhalation. Um, basically everyone in the PFT lab has to be aware of this. Um, you need to create airborne precautions. Also, cutaneous infections have been traced to contaminated biomedical devices. So this ends our most common pathogens found in the pulmonary function lab, and you should be aware of all of them, and you should also be aware of the precautions and who's at high risk for each of them. Now we're going to turn our attention to preventative methods for infection control in the pulmonary function lab. To control infection, it is necessary to find out how the disease is spread within the laboratory. So you've got to come up with some preventative measures and know a little bit about disease. You need to know if it's a from blood, is it from saliva, is it from contact? You need to know about the persistence of the pathogen outside the host. In other words, can it stay on inanimate objects? You need to know how to um, kill the disease, what kind of methods you could use to control the infection being spread. Um, so you really need to have a, a good handle on a few different things. And the next few slides are gonna go into more detail of exactly what needs to be done to minimize the spread of infections. Regarding personal hygiene, this is the cornerstone of safety and preventing the cross infection in the laboratory. You have to think about PPEs. You gotta be thinking about gowns. You gotta be thinking about gloves. You gotta be thinking about protective eyewear at times. You need barriers to prevent the cross infection of these things. Um, you need to use gloves when you're actually handling, handling contaminated equipment. 
Uh, you need to also uh, consider good hand washing techniques. And, you know, good hand washing techniques means that you're washing your hands vigorously for about 30 seconds at a minimum, uh, because a lot of times these pathogens could still be on your hand. Uh, you have to have sinks that have a elbow or wrist liver. Basically, you want to be able to shut the water off automatically with your elbow or maybe even light control. So there's so many different things you got to do to prevent uh, the cross infection. Uh, specifically for testing of infected patients with TB such and also other viral infections, you really need to be careful because, you know, the likelihood of you getting your sick yourself or actually spreading it to another patient is really, really high. So these are some of the basic things, and I don't need to tell you about PPEs. I don't need to tell you about hand washing techniques. I can also tell you about alcohol gels. You know, there's so many things you got to do, but really treat the pulmonary function lab just like you would treat an ICU and a patient who's under um, observation for possible infection. In the pulmonary function lab, the likelihood of someone uh, transmitting a infection to another patient is kind of low or the transmission of an infection to one of the healthcare workers is minimal. When you think about it, many people have a common cold or the flu during flu season, but that is considered a very low risk infection. But when you're talking about tuberculosis or you're talking about measles or you're talking about varicella, that increases the likelihood of that being considered high risk. So the idea of segregation is kind of important. As healthcare workers, you really have to have a good understanding of who is coming to your laboratory for pulmonary function testing. And I'll tell you a little bit about more about that in a little bit, but I wanted to say that some patients do come back to the lab with an infectious disease and they could be immunocompromised or they could be other type of infection they have. And you should really understand exactly who's who and who's what in your laboratory. There are some real common sense things you could do as separation of patients by, you know, greater than meter. You could also, um, you know, have negative pressure in the, in the lab. You could also have complete cleaning of the lab, you know, daily, whatever you need to do. It all depends on the outbreak. So there's so many different things that you could implement. But segregation of patients and screening of patients is imperative. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Let's continue our conversation about patient screening and segregation. I wanted to tell you about um, an audit that was done at two teaching hospitals where they both had pulmonary function labs. And this was done prior to any kind of test being done in the laboratory. And they did a screening and they wanted to figure out what kind of patients came into the lab. And it was just like a survey. Approximately 84% of the patients came in with no known infection. So they were pretty good. 10% of them were immunocompromised, which is something of a concern, and 2% of them had chest infections, and the re remaining 4% were positive for MRSA, either hepatitis C or B, or even tuberculosis. So the concept of segregation is really good in controlling the spread of infections in the laboratory. When you think about it, the immunocompromised patients should be scheduled first. They should be scheduled at the beginning of the day so that they, the likelihood of a cross infection is minimized with this group. Um, infected patients who come into the lab should be encouraged to wear surgical masks while in transit to the laboratory. Otherwise, patients who have known susceptible diseases should be sometimes placed in a separate room, especially if they have a waiting room. Separation of patients by at least one meter of distance is really important to control infection. Um, these patients need to be uh, separated. Also, they may have to wear a mask and other kind of uh, PPE to protect themselves and protect the people around them. As mentioned, 
surgical face masks, tissues, waste containers, alcohol-based sanitizers should be made available to these groups of patients. This way you can minimize the likelihood of getting an infection. And screening of patients and segregation of patients is imperative, especially with diseases that are highly contagious or airborne in nature. So I am sure as respiratory therapists, we all have done sputum induction at one point of our career. Sometimes laboratories, pulmonary function laboratories, exclusively do sputum induction for patients who have a trouble producing sputum spontaneously. So basically the patient inhales a nebulized hypertonic saline solution which liquefies airway secretions and it promotes coughing and then they you know, capture this sample in a dish. The idea during this process, if they have some kind of a communicable disease or if they have some form of infection, you don't want this to be spread to other patients who come in the laboratory afterwards. With that in mind, the concept of personal protective equipment should be used by healthcare worker when doing the sputum induction and also processing of the sample. You really need to be kind of careful. It's imperative to keep the door closed during a sputum induction and to minimize entry and exit into the room. So you need to really know what's going on. Also, if you could potentially have a negative pressure room, which would you know, remove the particles of air in the room, this is really important too, because you really want to minimize the cross infection of these patients. Sometimes the use of a local exhaust ventilation in the room is important or negative pressure. Uh, sometimes you need to consider when you um, have certain tubing or Petri dishes or funnels or any kind of other equipment in the laboratory, uh, it should be autoclaved after its use. The idea is to minimize the infection that could potentially occur from cross-contamination with this particular group of patients. So let's get on the topic of sterilization and disinfection. Sterilization and disinfection are the basic components of hospital infection control activities. This is the basis of controlling the spread of infection from one patient to another. Every day, several hospitals are performing various surgical procedures, but in our case, we're talking about pulmonary function lab. Before we get much further, I wanted to define what is the difference between disinfection and sterilization. Disinfection is a process of complete elimination of vegetative forms of microorganisms except for bacterial spores from inanimate objects. So that is an example of disinfection. Sterilization is defined as a process of complete elimination or destruction of all forms of microbial life such as vegetative and spore forms and it can be carried out by various physical and chemical methods. So sterilization is really wipes out everything where disinfection wipes out everything except for bacterial spores. Disinfection and sterilization techniques used in the pulmonary function lab are easy to use, they're compatible with the equipment, and this is what you really got to do. You know, you got to maintain sterility and you got to protect your patients in the lab. Some of the best recommendations to do is follow manufacturer's recommendations on the material provided. So this is where you understand how to decontaminate. And also you got to really think about cleaning is a very, very important step before sterilization and disinfection. You got to clean the equipment to make it safe. Examples of cleaning is to remove dirt, dust, any foreign materials on any kind of equipment that you're using before you sterilize it or before you disinfect it. Um, when you think about pulmonary function equipment, it's classified as semi-critical items and they require a high level of disinfection. For example, the use of biological indicators, 
that contain bacterial spores located inside a glass capsule should be used during the sterilization technique used and they should be doing this at least once a week to ensure the quality of sterilization. Sterilized equipment should also be stored properly. You should be stored in a nice, clean, dry, closed shelf. That's where all your equipment should be put out. It's not in the middle of the room, you know, hanging from the ceiling. It should be put in a very safe environment. So this way, the likelihood of getting dirt and dust on it and kind of spores on it is minimal. A very important understanding of sterilization and disinfection is to look at your material safety data sheet, commonly known as your MSDS, and it should be very much part of your infection control policy in your hospital. So these are some of the steps that you really need to do to maintain your equipment, to protect the clients that come into the lab, and also to to protect yourself and your other coworkers. This is a very nice slide because it tells you a little bit about the disinfection sterilization techniques for the pulmonary function lab for various things we use. For example, we're talking about mouthpieces, we're talking about nose clips, we're talking about valves, tubing, spaces, so on. It even goes down into uh, tubing, petri dishes, funnels, other type of equipment you found in the lab. Also, it goes even down to mopping of the floor and equipment surface cleaning. You know, all of these things are important. So, for example, in regard to surface cleaning, you know, you want to use phenyl alpha ethanol or isopropanol alcohol. You want to use it per the manufacturer's instructions. Basically, mopping the floor doesn't sterilize, but it disinfects. Also, during the time to really protect yourself during this process, you really want to use some protective uh, personal PPEs. So, you know, you want to put a gown on, some gloves on, mask. You know, you want to just sort of protect yourself. You know, it even goes down into like when you talk about mouthpieces, which are very common in the lab. And we talk about nose clips. You know. You should rinse them first in water to clean them, and then you finally will add some kind of chemical disinfection, and then what that will do will remove uh, vegetative bacteria such as TB, it'll remove viruses, including HIV, it'll remove hepatitis, uh, it'll also remove uh, bacterial spores. So these are some of the features that you really want to follow at, in a laboratory because you do want to reduce the likelihood of spreading the infection uh, to your coworkers and yourself and your patients. Let's talk about potential measures that can be taken for the protection of lung function test personnel for tidal breathing and forced measurements. Basically, what I'm talking about is you have a pulmonary function technologists who could be a respiratory therapist, they could be a nurse, they could be someone else who's highly trained, and you want to know what kind of protection they can take when they do lung function tests to prevent the likelihood of getting an infection. So there's some pearls of wisdom coming up on the next couple of slides for you to remember. So what can we do to protect our staff in the pulmonary function lab? When you think about the pulmonary function technologists, they could be a respiratory therapist, they could be a nurse, they could be someone who's trained to do pulmonary function tests. When you talk about them who are doing the test, you got to screen them too. For example, we just got over COVID or we're still in the midst of COVID. And sometimes, you know, you have to perform um, daily screens for your staff. You got to say, do you have any symptoms of COVID? Do you have any kind of problems with your temperatures? You know, all these kind of things got to be done. Also, you got to really think about patients who come in from home, if they got some kind of fever, if they got, you know, an RSV infection, or if they have some kind of... Um, process going on, they might have to get evaluated with a PCR test. There are many different things we got to do to protect our staff members before they actually come in the laboratory. And there are things that got to be done as respiratory therapists who are actually running these tests. You got to, especially in the days of COVID, you know, I'm going to talk up a little bit about COVID later, but you know, these are some things you really got to consider about. 
One of the tests that we commonly do in the laboratory is a forced expiration technique such as spirometry, DLCO. Um, when, it, when a therapist has to do pulmonary function tests, they are required to wear a mask and sometimes the mask has to be an N95. So it depends on the technique or the type of test being offered, you really need to wear a mask during these tests. So all, in all situations, you might have to wear gloves, you might have to wear a gown, all depends upon what's going on in the hospital. You might even need a face shield or goggles during the test. All of these things will protect the worker who's doing the test and make sure they're safe each and every day. A big concern is tests that require a strong cough, such as a bronchial challenge test, and or another, say, a high minute ventilation test or exercise test. This requires all kind of protection. This requires full protective measures, mask, gown, goggles, gloves. Um, if someone's doing a tidal breathing technique, such as helium dilution or multiple wash, wa nitrogen washout test, you get, really got to be protect yourself. So the point here is you really want to avoid the patient secretions. You also want to be gowned up. You also want to have gloves on between patients because you don't want to get sick and you don't want to share any kind of uh, illness with anyone else. To summarize some of the things we were just talking about, we were talking about what kind of test, which would be the method, and then we're talking about proposed protection measures for the personnel. For example, if we are doing um, tidal volume or force spirometry tests or DLCOs or MIPs or MEPs, some of the recommendations is to wear an N95 mask, gown, gloves, face shields, or goggles. You might have to, some patients need to put cappers on, you know, continuous air purifying respiratory devices, all depends, you know, if you've got a beard or if you have your face, your face anatomy is a little bit different. Um, also, many institutions have offered a plexiglass divider between the patient and the therapist. We see this in the drugstore. We've seen this during the COVID pandemic where people had this plastic, uh, you know, a clear plastic plexiglass between you and the patient. These are all good things to do and you gotta, you know, base it upon what you have. Other tidal breathing techniques such as a, a nitrogen washout or a sometry test, you need to wear surgical uh, face mask and gloves. These are some of the recommendations to stop the spread of infection and I'd highly recommend that you do it. I remember when COVID-19 first came out, and I do remember some good friends and colleagues who worked in the pulmonary function lab, and they were really concerned about doing pulmonary function tests uh, on these patients. And I don't blame them. You know, we didn't know much about it, what was going on. We didn't know how it could be transmitted. You know, there was a lot of concern and a lot of fear. So, but a lot of emerging research has shown that Patients who recover from COVID-19 have some kind of chronic symptoms of shortness of breath um, that are post-COVID. So in other words, they have COVID, they get better, and then as a result of that, they have dyspnea and they have breathing problems, which result in the fact that they need to go to the pulmonary function lab and be tested. With that in mind, you're wondering, what kind of protection can we do for our staff in the PFT lab? What do we know? What can we do? And, you know, is it necessary? There's so many different things going on with that, and we need to discuss each and every one. As we all know, dyspnea or shortness of breath is a independent predictor of morbidity and mortality in the general population. And with reduced functional capacity, this can really impact uh, breathing. Uh, it's a complex and multidimensional sim uh, symptom that can result in a dime, downward uh, spiral of avoidance of activity, deconditioning, and ultimately the inability to perform basic activities of daily living. So really, 
you need to understand when you have someone short of breath, you really need to do some serial PFTs on these survivors to see how well they're doing and if they're getting any better and how it's impacting their life. Adding to the problem, there's a growing body of literature indicating the presence of racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 related infections and hospitalization. So it's really a problem, especially impacting the Hispanic population who have a disproportionate burden of severe of COVID-19, have increased mortality, increased shortness of breath. So you really have to sort of screen these patients and see how well they're doing as time progresses. The American Thoracic Society came out with some recommendations for COVID-19 patients who are being tested in the pulmonary function lab. You know, we don't know much about it, but you know, there's been concern that the pulmonary function tests may represent a potential avenue for COVID-19 to be spread between patients and especially amongst patients who already have underlying lung disease. The process of doing a pulmonary function test on these patients where the potential for coughing and droplet formation is really high, and so the likelihood of transmitting the infection from one patient to another or between one patient and a staff member is very real. One of the major problems is the pulmonary function lab actually screens patients who have underlying respiratory conditions and it may be unrelated to COVID. In other words, someone might be coming in for COPD, but they're short of breath, or they could be an asthmatic and they're short of breath, and you may think they're being, they have COVID, or they may even have COVID. So you really don't know the impact of COVID on underlying medical conditions that require screening in a pulmonary function lab. With all that being said, we really don't know too much about the possibility of a transmission of the virus from one patient to another, from one patient to a healthcare worker, but we do believe it can be significant. We do believe it could be a real problem and it can be a real problem with certain groups, such as those who are elderly, someone that has severe lung disease, and also someone who is uh, immunosuppressed. So these are some of the key problems we have with testing the patients in the laboratory and the likelihood of trans transmission of that virus to someone else. So the American Thoracic Society, with all of this, made a recommendation during the COVID-19 that when you offer a pulmonary function test, when a doctor requires a pulmonary function test on a patient, it really has to be done for immediate treatment decisions. In other words, you want to order a test, a PFT, for those who really need to have some kind of intervention, you know, being uh, some drug intervention or some other type of invent intervention. So that's the recommendation from the American Thoracic Society that it be done with someone who really needs to be treated ASAP. To further their recommendation, they also say that all personnel should have PPE equipment uh, that will limit aerosolized droplet acquisitions also, they think that you need to have uh, your testing space need to be wiped down with some kind of chemical disinfectant. And also, when you use PPE, you really need to have a good understanding what's going on, especially when you talk to your infection control team. And we are talking about exclusively with the COVID-19 patients. In summary, you really need to have a balance between the potential risk and potential benefits of doing a pulmonary function test. And if you happen to do the test, you really need to assess the protection of the staff members and the people coming into the laboratory. So this is some of the recommendations that were set forth by the American Thoracic Society. I want to thank you all for joining my presentation on pulmonary function uh, 
infection control practices. Um, some of the key points I want you to remember is know the source of contamination, like know what type of pathogens could potentially be in the laboratory, know how to manage them. Also, screen and segregate your patients. In other words, if you know have some patients coming in for some tests, uh, especially if someone's immunocompromised, schedule them first, you know, do some different strategies. If you know someone has TB, you know, place, you know, put them in a separate room, do do whatever you can do to make it better. Um, know the different pathogens emerging from the laboratory. Like I mentioned, there are certain pathogens that are commonplace in the laboratory, certain pathogens that you should be aware of. Also, all of your staff need to use PPE. You really need to know when to apply PPE, and you also may potentially need to apply this to your patients that come in. And finally, the American Thoracic Society uh, published some COVID-19 precautions exclusive to the pulmonary function lab. And, you know, we are learning as we go along and we want to be safe. We want to keep our patients safe. We want to keep ourselves safe. And again, I want to thank you all for joining me. I have a short list of references. I have more references if you wanted them. But uh, these references is where I got the bulk of the information for my presentation today. And I hope that you enjoy it and learn from it. And all of you have a great day.